Andrew Mellon's mother remembers when she told him to clean up his room. And now he cleans up on House and Garden TV and Oprah. Andrew Mellon is an author, speaker, organizer, and coach. His book, Unstuff Your Life, talks about getting and staying organized. He helps his clients decrease physical clutter so that the mental clutter could give way to clarity and creativity. And he says the fear of change plays itself out in many different ways. And he writes the most attention-giving uh, blogs that I have ever read. I actually have read them a couple of times, and I was telling him this morning, I put some of them on my refrigerator right next to the picture of my grandson. <laughs> so welcome, Andrew. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out. I know that it is early, and I appreciate you being here. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by saying thank you to the Inside Edge and to Adrian for bringing me here. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, the publisher does, the book just came out in August, so the publisher does like me to talk about, you know, just to point out the book. This is my new book. It's called Unstuff Your Life. It's available everywhere. And um, I will reference it uh, while I'm talking occasionally. I mean, y y you can read it later, and that's fine. I just, I've done what they asked me to do, so <laughs> that's that. Um, I'd like to know uh, uh, how many of you have ever attended a workshop on uh, getting organized or on simplifying your life before? Great, okay, good, good, okay. And um, did everybody, did anybody bring uh, a stuff challenge with them? I mean, I didn't expect you to actually bring your grandmother's china, but did you bring, um, did you bring some questions for me? Yes. Good, excellent, okay, great. Okay, good. That's good. So I'm going to begin by telling you, it's, it sounds a little feedbacky. Yeah, um, if, uh, if we can take care of that, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to begin by telling you what uh, getting organized is and isn't, and then we're going to open it up into a big conversation. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you what getting organized isn't. And, and again, we have a time compression thing here, so I'm, this is not a plug to get you to come to the workshop on Sunday, although I'd love it if you did, but just there's a, there's a limit to how far down we can drill into um, clutter and getting organized in this brief period of time with me sharing information with you and then having enough time for uh, a full question and answer period, which for me is more important. I mean, I, it's a 400-page book. There's plenty of direction, clear concise direction in the book, and in the workshop where we'll be together for two full hours, there's a, there's a greater depth of information I can share with you. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to chinch you out of an experience this morning, I just want to be clear about the confines of the, the time limitations. So, so these, are, these are some things to keep in mind when we're thinking about getting and staying organized and simplifying your life. Getting organized is not about doing more, it's about doing less. And while that is a clever sound bite that I made up, it is in fact true. So what I want you to think about is, um, if you've ever tried to get organized and you've tried to impose this artificial system on top of your already busy, hectic day, and you found that the system broke down for you, that you couldn't quite maintain it, or that you could keep it up for a small period of time and then it just sort of dissipated, that's because you're trying to do something on top of what you're already trying to do. My philosophy of getting organized is really about eliminating everything that is non-essential to your life so that you are spending your time doing what is important to you, and, and then you will become organized. So it's not, it, it's not about um, clever words. It is, in fact, about eliminating those distractions that are keeping you um, busy and uh, ineffective or less effective in your day. Um, and another thing to remember is that urgency does not equal importance. Um, <laughs> Many people uh, will tug on you throughout the day. You might tug on yourself with this, um, this sense of urgency. Uh, it may or may not also be something that's important to you. So what you'll want to, to, to start thinking about, if you're not already thinking about it, is being able to discern the difference between those things that are urgent 
uh, that have no significance to you, that they might be somebody else's agenda, but it's not your agenda. And you can gently, politely, humanely say no thank you or not now, instead of getting knocked off the point of what it is that you're trying to accomplish in the given moment. Uh, the fact that a neighbor shows up and wants to borrow a cup of sugar, if you're running out the door to go pick up somebody at the airport, that's what's important to you. You can leave the door open, they can help themselves to the sugar, you can tell them to come back later, but you don't necessarily need to interrupt what you're doing. And again, there's a nice way to say it, it doesn't need to be brusque or, or rude, but there's a way for you to stay focused on the things that you are already committed to instead of getting pulled off track and heading in another direction. Um, getting organized is not a diet for stuff. So if you... Um, if you've ever, if you've ever um, tried to control your eating or your relationship to food, and you've had an experience where you've gone from either gorging yourself to then starving yourself in the hopes of somehow regulating your food intake, that's not what I'm proposing that you do with, um, with your stuff. Um, you do not want to starve yourself of objects and then suddenly find yourself at the mall you know, with 9,000 shopping bags. That's not the solution to getting organized. Um, you want to, uh, I talk about in the book, mindful consumption. And I believe that uh, you know, if you have an 8,000 square foot house and you have plenty of room for things, then you have room to store things. If you live as I do in a 300 square foot apartment in Manhattan, you do not have as much room for Yes, well, I also have a three-bedroom house in the Poconos, but, you know, I, I do have a 300-square-foot apartment in Manhattan, which is very much like a ship's cabin. Everything has to do double duty. I can't have anything there that's superfluous. Now, which isn't to say that I don't have art or beautiful things around me, but they also function in a way in my life. They aren't, they don't take up, sp they don't take up valuable space from something else that would be essential. And that's how I make my choices around what I, what I live with. Um, uh, getting organized is not a hobby, it is a means to an end. So again, going back to that artificial system that you might uh, have previously applied on top of your day, you, I don't propose that you replace disorganization with some sort of hyper-organization so that at two o'clock in the morning you're reconciling your checkbook in some sort of manic way. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a viable alternative in, in my world view. Um, Again, getting organized is about managing your things and your stuff well enough that you can finally spend the, the, the majority of your time doing the things that are important to you. That's, that's the journey. The journey is to clear away everything that distracts you from doing the things that are important to you. And, um, and I, when I'm working with clients in, in workshops, I always suggest that people, if you can break it down to math, then you can eliminate all of those feelings that you have around the stuff. If you're clear, like, this is what I'm committed to, and you can ask yourself simply, does this move me forward or does it stop me from getting where I want to be going? And at that point, there's, there, the feelings are not more important than the math equation of it's a yes or a no question. Does it or doesn't it? Am I moving forward? Am I not moving forward? Am I stuck? And that will help to dissipate some of that that um, uh, resistance and tension around stuff. Um, and the last thing that I want to say uh, in, the, in the no category is that you are not your stuff. Uh, certainly, we live in Western culture. There's a tremendous amount of information coming at us every day about things that we can consume and, uh, and that people are evaluating us on the clothes that we're wearing, the cars that we're driving, the neighborhood that we live in, um, uh, our jewelry, our, uh, where our kids go to school, um, who we sleep with, what we eat. Uh, I promise you they are going to continue to judge you on all of those things and you have no control over it. So there's no point in spending all of your time worrying about it and trying to manipulate your exterior in a way that is going to line up so that people will evaluate you in a favorable way. They're going to think what they're going to think regardless of what the choices are that you make. So again, if you can, if you can remember that and then let it go... You can, you can continue to make choices that have integrity for yourself regardless of what people are thinking of you because ultimately it's n nothing you can control and it's sort of none of your business. Unless they share it with you and then in which case you can have a conversation with them about it.
Now, what getting organized is and requires is willingness and consistency. It's not, again, it's not... Um, people like to think about discipline, you know, and, and, and they make that fist, and there's that sense of tension and, and you know, digging in and, you know, I'm going to get organized. And that's, um, that just, that's a nightmare, and that is not gonna, that's not going to move you forward. Um, uh, softening into some willingness and, and, and a willingness to be willing and a willingness to, um, to be consistent. So that uh, an example I like to share with people is if you like to, if you like to come home to a, bed, uh, to, a, to a bedroom where your bed is made, then you'll make your bed in the morning. Um, it, it, again, it's a, it's a simple equation. The bed, you might never like making your bed, but if you like coming home to a, to a bedroom where the bed is made, that's the choice that you'll make in the morning before you run out of, out of the door. I tell people all the time, someday doesn't exist. There is no mythical someday in the future where you're going to win the time lottery and you're going to suddenly have all of this surplus time that you don't have today. It's not going to happen. And later is a stepchild of someday. <laughs> so again, there's... There, Today, this is it. We all got up this morning, and again, thank you so much for coming this morning. Today is the day. This is it. Um, if you don't do it today, it must not be that important to you. Um, or it's clearly scheduled for some time in the future, and it's scheduled. It's not in this amorphous sort of foggy place where you'll get to it eventually. That will never happen because there will constantly be new things that come up that will interfere with those mythical plans. So if it's important enough to do, it's important enough to commit to and to schedule. And if it's not, then we can all stop fibbing to ourselves about something that we think or we, we want to be important to us, but it's not. One of the things that I encourage people to do, there's, the first chapter of the book is called You Are Not Your Stuff. And I have a series of exercises in it where I ask people to, to identify what their core values are. Um, so that you, you are making choices in your life based on what is important to you and you've actually taken enough time to, to be clear about that. Because again, it's, if, if what you value is um, compassion and um, promptness, but you don't actually manifest that on a daily basis in your life, either it's not really a core value of yours or you're making a lot of small intermediate choices between, that, between your core value and what you're actually spending your time doing. Um, there is enough time for what's important. And that speaks to the core values as well. I, often I am told, you know, my family is the most important thing to me. And this is from a mom who is consistently 15 minutes late to get to her daughter's soccer game. So in those 15 minutes... Her family is not the most important thing to her. Her keys are, or her wallet is, or her cell phone is, or her purse is. And what her daughter knows is that my mom can't ever seem to get to my game on time. That's what she knows. So you can tell yourself, oh, my family is the most important thing to me, but if you're spending those 15 minutes with your keys or your mobile phone or your wallet, that's what's most important to you. So by, by eliminating that you will actually bring your core values into play in your life. So the way to do that uh, is, th these are the two foundations. There's a triangle of organization in my world. Um, the two main wings of the, of the triangle are one home for everything and like with like. If you do that, you will solve 85% of your problems. One home for everything, like with like. One home for everything means everything has only one home. It's either in its home or it's being used. So your keys have a home in your house. They're either in your hand, they're unlocking something, or they're in their home. You'll never not find your keys if they're always in their home or you're actually using them. The home is not universal in the sense that my keys live in their home in my house, your keys live in your home in your house. It, in my house, it's a hook just inside the, the front door. In, in your house, it might be in a tray on a table just inside your front door. It needs to be near the front door, and it needs to actually be in something. The top of a table is not a home. It needs a vessel or something to corral it so that it's not like you just throw the keys on a surface and they're in their home. That, that's not a home. That's a general sort of toss. And when, you, when, it, when it comes time to find your keys, you'll be looking under magazines and other things that are not in their home to try to find the keys in their home. 
Like with like means that similar things live together. So utensils live with utensils. Cooking utensils live with cooking utensils. Serving utensils live with serving utensils. They're not the same. When you're, when you're reaching for a spatula to turn an egg, you also don't want to be reaching for the sterling tongs that you're later going to serve something with. They're not the same kind of utensil. Um, Office supplies live with office supplies, clothes live with clothes, books live with books. The one exception to that rule is, of course, cookbooks, which can live in the kitchen because they are a tool in the kitchen. They wouldn't really serve you in your library, particularly if your library is several rooms away from the kitchen. Every time you want a recipe, you don't want to have to leave three rooms to go find your cookbooks. But um, other than those few exceptions, like lives with like. So if you have nine pairs of scissors scattered around your house and you can never find any of them, that's because they're not in their home and they're not together. Um, the third leg of the triangle is, <laughs> yeah, yes, the third leg of the triangle is reaching stuff equilibrium. And again, that is different for everybody. So if you have a big house, your level of stuff equilibrium is different than mine. But the idea is you want to have enough of whatever it is that provides comfort and convenience in your life. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that anybody become an ascetic and you know, live with just a rice bowl and a, and a pair of chopsticks and a robe. It's not required. <laughs> but whatever stuff equilibrium is for you, that's where you want to get to so that you have enough of everything and nothing that's superfluous or doesn't serve you. Whatever that amount is, I mean, I don't have an agenda around what that is. The point is, once you've reached stuff equilibrium, then we apply the third rule, which is something in, something out. So that when you're buying a new pair of jeans, it's because you're replacing a pair of jeans that, that you'll no longer wear. You, you, when you replace a pair of sneakers, it's not that suddenly the old pair becomes the pair that you're going to mow the lawn in. So you're not going to let them go. You're just going to put it in the closet and, and try to remember to put them on when you go outside to do the lawn. That's not going to happen. So those can now be recycled, and we're done with those. And a new pair of sneakers comes in. Now, there are exceptions if you need formal wear and you need to go buy a new gown or something and you're not necessarily replacing a gown. There are a few exceptions to that. But ideally, we want to reach stuff equilibrium and something in, something out. One home for everything, like with like, something in, something out. Two other things I want to share with you, and then we're going to open it up into questions. Um, Every task has a beginning and an end. This is another tremendous time killer. You know, ask yourself how many times you've started a task and actually not finished it. You've gotten two-thirds of the way through the task. You've gotten three-quarters of the way through the task. You tell yourself, it's good enough. I'm done. The, when you do the laundry... <laughs> The beginning of the task is bringing the dirty clothes to the laundry room. The end of the task is when the clean clothes are actually in their drawer or hung up. Not when the laundry basket is on the floor in your bedroom and you think, I've done the laundry. Mm, you've started the laundry and you've done part of the laundry, but you haven't completed that task. So when you, when you don't complete things and you leave them two-thirds of the way done, half done, three-quarters of the way done, seven-eighths of the way done. You're setting yourself up again for that, that later time when you're going to put the laundry away, but there will be something that will, that will draw your attention away and you will, keep, you will trip over the laundry basket because it's going to be sitting on your bedroom floor for days longer than it needs to be. The end of that task is that laundry basket, empty now, is back on top of the dryer waiting for the next load of, of clothes to go into it. And the last thing that I want to share with you, and this is, a, this is a tool that you can use when you're trying to... When, it, if you're somebody who gets stuck saying, you know, I want to get organized, I just don't know where to begin, or I, everything, you know, every, I, it's hard to discern, everything is so important to me. Well, if everything is precious, then nothing is precious. And while that, again, is a clever soundbite that I made up, it is true. If everything is precious, nothing is precious. So if you can imagine, God forbid, a fire in your home, and you had 30 seconds to leave the house, what would you grab? That's what's precious. That's what's important. And if that's your children or your spouse or your companion animal, then really the rest of it doesn't matter, does it? Um, it might be stuff that you like to have, but if you wouldn't risk your life for it, suddenly it shifts in its perspective and its, and its importance in your mind. Uh, 
And if, if a collection of family photos is the most important thing to you, I'm not necessarily suggesting next to the Keys home that that's where the photos live, but you want to know where they are and you want them to be in some sort of container so that if, God forbid, you had to bolt out of the house in 30 seconds, you could grab the thing that was most important to you and exit and not have to, you know, we don't want to live our lives with regret. And that would be a tremendous the fire itself would be a tremendous tragedy, but then to lose the one thing that was important to you because you couldn't find it would be an unnecessary tragedy. So let's, there are certain tragedies that we cannot possibly um, avoid. The ones that we can, let's try to. And that's what I'd like to share with you as some fundamentals. And now I'd like to open it up to, to questions. And please, I, I, I'm going to ask you to... Um, to not speak in hypotheticals. I mean, this isn't a laboratory. If you have actual stuff challenges in your life, things that you are stuck with, I, I want to answer those questions for you. Okay, so um, great. If um, we'll start here, please. Yep. Thanks very much. Paper uh, huh? in the kitchen, pile of paper on the desk uh, in my office, piles of, I'm a teacher, piles of paper for this client, that client, that client. Um, do, you, uh, do you file? Do you have a filing system? It's full. <laughs> what does that mean? The, if I open up the drawer, the stuff in the drawer is filled. There's no space to put it. Um, well, then you either need another file cabinet or you need to go through your file drawers and figure out what, again, in, in there is essential. I was just talking to a teacher at a workshop a couple of days ago. Um, she has lesson plans from 10 years ago that... Um, my suggestion to her was that she go through those lesson plans and figure out what is um, a universal lesson plan that is not topical or time sensitive, because those are the things that have legs and those are the things that you'll use again and again. The, the one section that you taught once on one specific subject that you will never return to, and by the time you do the data or the information is different, um, that can now be recycled. That is no longer anything that you're ever going to touch again, and you can either scan it and save it as a digital file if it has some sentimental meaning to you, but it's no longer a tool for your work, so you don't need to keep that. Um, and uh, and uh, as if there's bills in there, first of all, like with like, so the bills don't belong with your lesson plans, and we want to segregate those apart, and everything that you can, everything that you can digitize and save electronically, I encourage you to do so. Thank okay, you. thank, thank you. you. This lady and then this fellow, please. So what I got from my grandmother was mm. this beautiful, <laughs> two beautiful chests of solid cherry wood, which I use and love, and a bed that is a full-size bed, not a queen, not a king, and it's been in my, my garage for a long time because I don't want to get rid of it. It matches the other, but it will probably never fit me, and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, let it go. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about this with just uh, just with somebody just the other day. I know, I know, I know. Um, the idea, the the idea of um, of holding on to something because it's part of a set, and you know when you pass it along, you want the integrity of the set to be there. So you use two cups and a creamer from a set of service for twelve. And the rest of it's all sitting in your garage, not necessary. And in this case, you love the two chests, you don't love the bed. Whoever gets that bed is not gonna know that there's something missing. Where are, aren't there supposed to be more pieces? Where are those pieces? They're gonna be delighted to get that bed. So um, if you're not going to use it, I understand it's tender, but it's, let it go. Please. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, on stuff equilibrium, what about books? Yeah. And then, and and, uh, and remember, <laughs> you know, here at the Inside Edge, we're encouraged to buy books every week. Uh huh. <laughs> so, uh, is, it, is it, you know, it, what I do with paperback uh, fiction, I don't, I read them and give them away. Good. And so I, I have a whole. But I have a different uh, thought about nonfiction books, so I have a certain, and I actually do have a thought like I don't want to buy very many more because I have enough, you know, or uh, and I'm but I'm not sure I still go. So I'm, I'm. What is your thought about books and? Uh, 
stuff equilibrium. Well, even, um, even nonfiction books, if they're reference books that you actually use, then that's great. If, 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 there is a distinction between fiction and nonfiction, but if it's a nonfiction book that once you've read it, you're done with it and you will not go back to it, I, I think it joins its siblings in the fiction land and it goes off <laughs> to other places. Um, I, or, you, or you buy some more bookshelves. I mean, again, if, you, if, if the books are more important to you than a blank wall, then put another bookcase up. I mean, there's no, there's no limit. I mean, you could turn your entire living room into a library if, if books were the most important thing to you. If in your value system, books are more important than a place to sit down, and I'm not being facetious, but if that's the case, then give away the sofa and put in some more bookcases. It's, it's just make the choice that serves you. It doesn't, uh, you're, you know, people have turned bedrooms into studies. People have turned, uh, you know, offices into gyms because what they want to do in that room is exercise, not work at a computer. So you can make whatever choice serves you. If you've run out of room, th then something has to go. So it's either a, it's a credenza or it's a bookcase. Okay? You. Great. Um, you, sir, and then you, and then you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please. I, I don't know if this is on. Um, before you say let it go. Stand up. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Before you say let it go, uh -huh. Chotskys. Chotskys that are sentimental because they were handed down in the family for 100 years, but it doesn't make you go forward like you said. Do they make you happy? Sure, but they no, no, fill no, up no, no, space. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. Do they make you happy? I would say yes, because the ones that don't make me happy, I have gotten rid of. Uh-huh. You, and you don't have enough room for, the, for all of them? It's getting a little out of control. Well... You just said that some. You said that they're a hundred years old and they came from your family. So, are you buying new ones to augment the ones that are that you inherited? No, I'm not buying new. <laughs> so then, how did you run out of room? If you didn't have enough room, it, it, we bought a bigger house. <laughs> I, I'm not following you. I mean, you, 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 if you've inherited a chunk of tchotchkes, uh -huh. and um, and you had enough room for them then how did you run out of room for them? Because I get more family stuff. A lot of it's from uh, family, and I got more and more, and the house was oh, filling so, up, so, so we as, got a bigger house. As people leave the planet, you just keep getting more and more stuff. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can, I mean, you can share some of it with, do you have any other surviving relatives? She's, they're in the same boat. I have a sister. Uh -huh. Same situation. Yeah. They're splitting all well, this so stuff. Then, okay, then what I would suggest is that I would lay them all out, and I would... Pick two dozen. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm just making up an arbitrary number. You can decide how much room you have. I would lay them all out and find the ones that are the, the most important of the important. And those would be the ones to keep. So my question would be, which I can understand, because my husband is like, what is this? The importance versus sentimental. And that's where it's a tough decision. Right. Well, I mean, if, if the sentimental attachment is that somebody you were related to historically touched yes. it. <laughs> That's not much of a sentimental attachment. If it's, if it's, if this is an object that you know your grandmother drank out of every day, and now you want to keep this, that makes sense to me. If it was in a cupboard on a third shelf that she never used, and just the fact that she owned it at one point, that's a different. I mean, that's a different attachment. That's that's some sort of familiar relationship, but it's okay. not necessarily a sentimental attachment. It's not like when you were sick and visiting her, this is what she always served you tea in. Do you okay. understand? I mean, that, that's that clears. That's a little more clear to right. put some attachment with the amount of sentiment that's with the. Product. Exactly, I, I and the and the okay. other thing that I want to talk about that very briefly is be very careful of fetishizing objects and charging them with the responsibility of carrying an entire lifetime of memory because when that object breaks, you will, you will in essence lose those memories. It is much better to hold the memories in yourself than to charge this with the responsibility of summing up your entire relationship with your grandmother. This is, this is a temporary object, you know, and... and and when it breaks, you run the risk then of losing that connection with those memories instead of remembering them all the time. I mean, this is too small to hold all of those memories. Yes. Um, yes, sir. We on? Um, this may be just more of a comment, but it, it's uh, and a reframing. I have found that as I've gotten older, I have a big house, 
garages down here outside, cars in the garage. I'm up in one of these rooms and I'm thinking, I gotta take this to my car, but I don't wanna walk there, so I'm gonna set it aside. And then I'll be in another room and I'll think the same thing. And, and what I found is, at least as I got older, I wouldn't remember them. So what I've done now is a discipline, but I'm gonna reframe it in terms of your stuff, is if I'm thinking it's, it's gonna go in the car, I don't wait, I take it right to the car and put it there right now. And I'm, I'm reframing that now as every task has a beginning and an ending. Would that be an example of uncluttering my life because then I don't have to remember it? Yes, uh, that's excellent, yeah. thank you. Okay. Well, I so, will say that um, I, I have certainly encouraged people to have a basket just outside, just inside the door to the garage, which could be the home for everything leaving the home, mm -hmm. so that you don't necessarily need to open the door and go into the car itself. Everything could just be deposited in the basket, and then the basket could be picked up and taken into the car when you leave. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you've got a variety of things like, oh, I have to return this to the store, and then I want to take that to the dry cleaners, and yeah. I have to return this yeah. to Bob down the street, all of that could go in the basket so that you don't have to make right. multiple trips. But right. yes, that's thank exactly you. right. Yep, thank you. Um, do, this, oh, great. And then you and you'll just keep raising your hands. I probably need, <laughs> I probably need two hands for this to put over my ears. But what is your opinion of storage bins? <laughs> <laughs> I think they make other people a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, if it's that important to keep, the only thing that I believe believes in offsite uh, belongs in offsite storage is either um, fine antiques with clear provenance or fine art that has clear provenance. Um, other than that, um, you know, if you're keeping an old sofa or a toaster or something, thinking that you're going to need it someday when the current toaster breaks or the dog rips up the old, so you know, the current sofa, by the time you go to to harvest that out of storage, you will have paid for it two or three times. The the average in the United States right now is that things go into temporary storage for 15 months. So if you figure that if you're spending $200 a month on that storage, that's $3,000. Do the math. Could you replace everything that you're putting in there? Um, thank you. Could you replace everything that's in there for that $3,000? And uh, the one exception, again, is if you're between homes and it's clearly temporary storage because you had to vacate one residence and you can't yet take occupancy of the second residence, and so for two or three months, you're housing all of your belongings someplace. But if you're just taking certain belongings because you're not ready to let them go, just be clear that you're spending money to delay a decision, and that's all it is. You're just you're spending some money to procrastinate. So if you have the money and you want to procrastinate, you may, but it's not necessary. Um, this lady and then you, sir. Well, you're standing. You talk and then this lady. Okay. Okay, great. You have a great approach to this topic. Uh, so what made you interested in this topic? And do you have a dark side regarding this? <laughs> I actually own several storage bin companies. <laughs> um, I, you know, no. I. I, I'm in the light. I've, um, I, I do have a dark side, but I'm not going to share it with you here. Um, uh, you know, I did nonprofit arts administration for many years, and I was a director and a producer um, in the theater. And uh, so I was used to creative problem solving. Um, I just did it in metaphor. And uh, at some point, I stopped talking in metaphor, and it just became a, a, a practical, real transmission of information. And the reason that I enjoy these workshops so much is because, I mean, it's similar to the work I did in the theater where I'm getting to interact with more than one person at a time. I mean, the, the work that I do with clients is very intimate, um, very intimate. And um, uh, it's demanding, and it's, uh, there's a limit to how many people I can reach. So this gives me, I mean, it's a little more superficial, but it gives me a chance to interact with a lot of people in a short period of time and share, a, a, you know, some significant information. So does that? Yes. Great. Please. Mine has to do with other people's stuff in my house. Uh-huh. Like my children. Uh-huh. Um, particularly my daughter, who's now 19, went out to school. We had a nanny that was integrated as part of our family who passed away a couple of years ago. So like... There's a lot of stuff that the nanny gave my daughter, the stuffed animals, I mean, bags. And, and 
She's got this thing about not wanting to let go. She, your daughter? My daughter. Where does she live? Well, she's back. In your house? Yeah. Ah. She came back during the summer and decided she's making different decisions, and so she's parked there. I, when she left, I told her, I'm going to just keep it for this period of time, but when we move, which we're going to be doing soon, I don't want it coming with me. Right. It's um, not coming with you. But it, there's a lot of, um, and it's something I haven't heard you tap onto yet, and she kind of was getting to that, and everything physical has emotional energy, energy, let me just uh -huh. say energy, and we do attach emotions to objects, and it's not really about the object, and just as a song will bring back a memory, sure. and put you in that space and time, so do certain items, and obviously, in the case with my daughter, you know, there's love attached to those things. And the nanny is gone. Right. And that's all she feels. A lot of... God, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> but, you, but your daughter's not here. So it's... I mean, this is her process. You're describing her process, She's yes? in my house, and the stuff is no, in No, 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 I, I understand. But what I'm saying is that you're, you're talking about her attachment to the objects. I mean, she, she can go get a storage unit for her stuff... It doesn't need to be in your home. If you're clear that you're done, then she can, she can hire her own space and have her own process. And if it takes her 30 years or three days to, to sort through her own feelings, um, I mean, and, and we can talk about that after the workshop. I mean, but, but that's, you, do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, you're, you're here, it's sort of you're triangulating the, the experience. She's got her own relationship to that stuff and you're here sort of advocating for yourself and at the same time sort of defending her procrastination. But I have a role in it. Wh which is what? Uh, the role is that if she doesn't do what you're suggesting would be the thing for her to do because she's probably not emotionally mature enough for that right uh -huh. now or whatever, you know. Does she work? No. That's, I'm trying to get that going. I see. So, so <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, does she, does she have an allowance or does she have, does she have some no, sort of... No, no, I'm not a good parent. No, no, no. She's, no, she's, she's been beyond a 4.0 for years. She's worked very hard. She was off. Right. I don't want to, I'm sorry. I, I don't want a big story. So I made I just, priorities for her. The schooling was more important than her working. Right. She's back. I have made that you know, part of the new rule, right. which we're sorting So you're out. supporting her in this, in this chunk of time? In this transition. So what you can do as a part of the support is to say, for this chunk of time, I will, I, part of your allowance is that I will pay $150 a month, for, you know, you, not for cigarettes or, you know, for cocktails with your girlfriends, but I will pay it for a storage unit for you to have this stuff off-site, and you may interact with it as you like. When we move, and you do whatever you're doing, that becomes your responsibility. So you have this chunk of time to address it, and you can either dig into it, or you can delay it, but it, when the clock ticks, and that, when we reach that deadline, it becomes your charge. She's 19 years old. I mean, she's not 12. I know. She, she's an adult, and, and she can now take... Res I mean, if it's important enough for her to keep, it's important for enough to, to be in relationship with. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Hello? Right. Hi. Hi. Uh, it was a garage full of my grandmother's, uh, you know, old furniture. Yes. Uh, sentimental. Uh, somebody says they think it's walnut. Do you work with some kind of uh, antiquer where they come out or you have to take a piece to somebody? Do uh, so you know if it's of value? Otherwise yeah, I mean, if, uh, if you have objects, if anyone has objects that they are questioning the value, of course, uh, whether you hire me or whatever you do, I would always suggest that you get an appra a, a neutral appraiser, not somebody who has a, has a vested interest in either a lowball appraisal or a, uh, an inflated appraisal, but somebody to come and evaluate it. I mean, you know, the, we've all heard the story about the Jackson Pollock that's found in the, you know, the back of a garage or something. I mean, we would, of course, try to determine the value, the actual value. The thing about value to remember is it, something only has value if more than one person agrees that it has value. <laughs> so um, the reason that fine art has value is because somebody's willing to pay $3 million for a Picasso. If everybody decided tomorrow that Picassos aren't that special and they're only worth 75 cents, 
what you thought was valuable, I mean, it still might be valuable to you because you think it's a beautiful thing, but if nobody's willing to give you $3 million for it, it's no longer worth $3 million. You know, we trade in diamonds, we trade in fine art, we trade in antiques, but you, you, you buy that new BMW and you thought it was worth $62,000. Tomorrow, somebody might think it's worth $38,000. So where did that money go? So, do you understand? Right, so, I mean... Right. We, so, do you have a neutral antiquer that you work with? Because I'm looking for a number to call. Well, let's not do this now. Let's okay, talk after that. the workshop and okay, we'll have another conversation. Um, yes, please. Uh, a point of contention. Um, I, I'm really ADD. And, okay. Uh, so, what happens is... I'll get halfway through organizing something, and maybe I've moved a pile around. Maybe I've made more piles. Um, the, the issue is, let's say I, I pick something up and it needs to go over there. There might be other things that need to go there. My wife is like, put it all in one pile and then go out at once. If I start making that pile, none of it's going to get there. So okay. I'll pick up the one thing, go put it away, and go back. And so the point is, is there a better way or... Because it, once I start making the pile, I'm screwed. It's just, I just well, have another pile. I mean, so we're, cl so we're clear that that way isn't the right way because that's not working. Um, uh, it, it sounds like this, like this fellow said, I think in your case, if you're having difficulty staying focused for you know, an extended period of time and 20, you're, easy, you're, right, you're easily distracted, <laughs> then I think that the mechanical workaround for you is to, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure your wife is a lovely woman. Ignore her. And um, <laughs> pick up the object and take I'll it. I'll tell her you said that. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. She can find me on the web. I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with her. Pick up the object and take it where it wants to go because you can complete that task. And even though it might seem to somebody else redundant, it's not redundant to you. So... Even if you have to, you have to wear a, a, you know, a path into the, into the rug because you're doing it 9,000 times to get everything from those piles distributed where they belong, do it. I mean, that is, that, that's a sane workaround for, a, for a, a challenge that you face. And her, her suggestion might work for her. So when she's organizing, you can say, honey, you make all the piles you want, and when you're ready with your pile, you move it wherever it belongs. This is how I'm going to do it from now on, and I'll see if that works. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, yep, I'm oh. sorry, yep, yep. Okay, no, go, go, you're up, you're up. You got a microphone, go. Yes, I have a couple of little questions. Um, a one couple? Yeah, they're quick. <laughs> one is, what do you uh, think about the rule that some people make, if you haven't worn it in a year, or some people say two years, then get rid of it? Uh, is that something that you uh, recommend following? Yes. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, and I mean, the exception, again, is a ball gown. Right. I mean, if you don't go to balls every month, <laughs> then, and, and it still fits you, and it is a timeless design, that it's not some sort of wacky, crazy thing that was beautiful in 1987 and would <laughs> never be worn again. You know, okay. if, it's, if, it's, if it's haute couture and, it's, um, and it really has legs, then again, keep it, because it's timeless. If it's you know, if it's sud you know, uh, seeking, suddenly seeking Susan and it's, you know, all ripped up and crazy, it's, you're done. Okay. And then the other thing is uh, similar to what this other lady was asking about children's stuff. I have uh, two, uh, uh, two grown daughters and my attic, uh, much of it is uh, their childhood things that they've collected, uh, school papers that they did when they were in kindergarten and things like that. And great, great. I, yeah. I got it. I got it. What? So I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, uh, old math homework. Not a sentimental object. <laughs> it was there so that they could learn their timetables. I mean, that's it. They're, they're done. When, I mean, think about your own lives. If that's what your mother handed you as the end of, here, go out into the world. Here's your math homework from second grade. That's not a sentimental object. Now, the, the drawing that you made that was really quite something, that might be something to keep. And if it, again, if it, is, if it was that beautiful, then why isn't it framed and on the wall? What if, about their first printing, like in the first grade when they first started their first letter writing? And how old are your kids? 29 and 26. Okay, so this is what you do. I mean, they're adults. Do they have their own children? No, no. No, but almost. Um, why don't you ask them, how important is this stuff to you? I mean, do they have their own homes? Yeah, but they don't have the room to store it, so I'm you, storing it. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, not, um, this is, this is not for you. Um, 
this is for them. I mean, okay. these, are, these are adults. If it's that important for them, then you need to have a conversation with them. And we are out of time. So thank you all very much. Thank you.